means that it is time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for Thursday. It's Thursday, which means that we are simulcast to the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. We are live on LinkedIn. We are live on YouTube. And for our huge and growing audience on Twitch, we're live there too. So 100% last week. Good afternoon. Doing well? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you for I, asking, well, Jeff. How are, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm looking forward good. to another good conversation today. I'm excited about the guests that we have in the green room right now. Our guest has requ- has requested red M&Ms only today. And so we have complied and the green room is full of red M&Ms. Uh, But we'll get to that guest here in just a minute. For those of you that have never joined us before, I come here every weekday afternoon. Thursdays are special, but every weekday afternoon, I host these Context and Clarity conversations for just one reason, so that you can find clarity around the things that matter most to you. Now, most of the time, our audience is full of architects. Today, I expect it to be the same. We may actually have some others as well. So to all of you, welcome. We're looking to find clarity around the things that matter, no matter if you're the employee of a firm, maybe you dream of starting your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar and said, hey, 2021's the year that I do my own thing. Or maybe you are an an owner. Maybe you own a firm. Maybe you own a business. You've owned it for a year or 10 years or 20 years, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm is. Could could be 25 years. How many years have you been in business, Catherine? 25. 25. And, All right. And a month and a half. So, yeah. Oh. <clears throat> I'm just, I'm just keeping a... track now because why not? You're not, you're not uh, are you marking off the days on the calendar? Yeah. To what? I don't know what's happening after, but yeah. So, I'm not sure we're on Facebook. If we're on Facebook, right. if someone could comment, that would be great. I can't find it. That's a good point. All right. We're going to check check the uh, technology <laughs> here for a minute. I think we might have to. Anybody out there on Facebook? Or are we having technical difficulties? I think we're experiencing some. So we've, yeah, got, we only we've have got YouTube. YouTube. Okay. Anybody out there on Facebook? Maybe we need to go to the mystery button. I do not see it popping up on Facebook. All right. Let me see there. Uh, all right. John Kenny says we're not on Facebook for some reason. Okay. Let me see if I can figure this out on the fly here. Okay. Um, and then we, we, we apologize for the technical difficulties here, but we'll jump into it back into it here momentarily. Well, you know what? The good news is that John Kenny wants us to be on Facebook so much that he went to LinkedIn to tell us that we aren't there. So <laughs> this, this is true. And Brian McCartney, we see you over there on LinkedIn as well. Very good. What's Adam. <laughs> Hi, Adam on LinkedIn. Glad you're joining us. Okay. Well, well, maybe we're just not on Facebook today. <clears throat> Let me um, let me try one other thing. See, the scary part is I'm I'm always afraid to uh, click on buttons because <laughs> I don't want to kill the feed. But I'm going to try. Well, what's the worst that could happen? All we right, I'm going to try one. Back. I'm going to try one thing here. We'll see what happens here. No, I John can't. Jones has decided to just join us on LinkedIn anyway. So. Okay. Well, I think that's what we're going to have to do. If um, I'll short- just post. You know what I'll do is I'll post on Entree Architect and tell them that we're having difficulties and they should go to LinkedIn. Okay. Perfect. LinkedIn or YouTube, tw- Twitch if they want to. We're just going to carry on. Um, don't know what the problem is, but uh, apologize for that. And we're going to keep going. 
This is the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation. Today, possibly only <laughs> uh, streaming to LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitch, but uh, we really appreciate all of you that have joined us today, and we're getting into it here. So let's go ahead. Um, uh, for those of you who have never joined us before, the format on Thursdays as we live stream, as we simulcast to... Uh, to all of the all of the internet, all the spots on the internet is that Catherine McPhail, who is uh, with me here, is my co-host, and we have a special guest that joins us uh, every Thursday for the live version of this as well. And the reason that we do that is so that we can dig deeper into uh, whatever the topic of the day is. This week we've been on a theme of I, I've been calling it your value mindset. What value do you bring? What value do you create? for your clients. So we've talked about that value. We've talked about uh, what you should charge for that value. Uh, we've talked about how you communicate that value and how you create proposals that are clear and that that communicate that value. And so today I'm excited for this conversation because the topic that we'll talk about today is one way that architects could potentially extend the value that they provide, maybe even extend the value that they create for their clients. So I'll be interested to see where this conversation goes today. Our guest today is a co-founder, a co-host, and a co-teacher. He's maybe first an entrepreneur, but definitely an architect, a builder, and a developer. His firm is F9 Productions in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, his podcast is Inside the Firm, and his course is Architect to Builder. Lance Psycho, let me click this button, see if that works at least. There we go. There's Lance. Lance, welcome to Context and Clarity. And now, uh, just so everyone knows, the inconvenient truth is that Al Gore will not be able to join us today. <laughs> Well, somebody has to take the meeting. So, Lance, thank you for uh, joining us. And Al, we're sorry you couldn't be here. <laughs> that was the best pun. That was the best pun I've heard in I, years. Years. I, I'm going to give you years on that one, Jeff. Wow, that's Bravo. pretty good. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Well that. Done. I've been I'm working on it all day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's what happens when, you, when you've when you got a, a name like that. So uh, again, Lance, thanks for being here. Why don't we, why don't we start out this conversation today? Because uh, the topic is architect as builder. The topic might be architect as master builder, but let me, let me start out the conversation by asking, asking this question, fill in the blank. An architect should become a builder if blank. Architect as builder. The topic uh -huh. might be architect as master builder. But let, Catherine, me, let me start out the conversation by asking, asking this question. Fill in the blank. An architect. Catherine, do you have? That was me. I Sorry. thought, why isn't Jeff's face moving? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we're going to make everything that could go wrong in this sim live simulcast is going to happen today, Jeff, and it's going to be over. We don't have to do it again. That's all right. Was, that's, was, that's part of being live. Um, so it was such a good question. I wanted to hear it again. Okay. So I'll, no, I'll I did. I heard it twice. So Lance, what do you think? What do you think? Fill in the blank. An architect <laughs> should become a builder if. Number one, if you build your own house, if you are, if you are planning on designing you should build your own house. There is actually no better example of you um, being able to have complete control over the process and then at the same time uh, learn the process on your own dime. I mean, essentially, yes, me, you might be taking out a loan for that, but I can't think of a better way for you to take the leap into becoming. And what I like to say is, Alex says too, is that it's not for us, it's not about architect as builder, it's about actually architect plus builder. Uh, we like to look at that. It, the way we approach it is uh, when, when we're with, we're, we're actually more selective when we go to build for people about who we'll build for than who we'll design for, which is maybe kind of counterintuitive. Uh, and the reason we do that is because there's a, there's a much better, there's a much longer period of feeling everybody out uh, during the design process to understand if it's a good fit moving, moving ahead. Cause you know, there's, there's sometimes when we get through a design process and it's like, okay, I'm glad we're done 
we're done designing with this project. I'm not sure we want to continue that working relationship mm -hmm. further. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, I think that's also a great segue because we have been talking all week about this idea of the value that architects bring to clients or generate for clients. So, and, and I know you've been doing this for a while, right? You didn't just start this year suddenly building things. Uh, you've played role of developer and builder and and um, and now you've got the course of, of course, that was weird. Um when when you've gone as you've gone through this evolution over time what how does that how does being a builder for some again you're selective about it how does being a builder for some of your clients um how does it add value to them or does it add value to them to the client the the trust is already established. That's okay. the number one thing. They're they're trusting us with maybe, and I like to tell people, even if they're just design clients, the first time we're in a sales meeting with them and getting to know them as people first is that this should be a fun process for you uh, because you might only do this once in your life. You might only have the capital to be able to build that first business. It might be your, the only business you want to do. You might have that working capital to do that addition you've been dreaming of, that remodel you've been dreaming of. It needs to be a uh, fun process, an enjoyable process, something that you don't come out with a bad taste in your mouth about that. So uh, the value then that that you add on top of that is the, the trust that's are, that it's already built off of sort of that conversation of right of that and, and the way we structure our build contracts and the way we kind of encourage it too. Uh, once we get into the you know later on in details with the course is that it's open book. And so they they can see every single bid from every from every single sub. They can see exactly where every penny is going. So just that reassurance, while while these folks are taking on probably the biggest risk they've ever taken on in their lives, especially those small business owners. Uh, we have one right now that we're going to be building pretty soon. It's a uh, four thousand square foot um, tenant finish, and this gift gal has saved her whole life to start this business. It's her dream. It's going to be kind of what takes her from an empty nester and fills that void with not having children anymore. And this is her new baby, so to speak. So that that's really the value, I think, is that you are, you're so you're taking the trust you've already built as an architect over here, and then as the builder over here, and you're really meshing the two together. And it's a complete circle at that point. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Um, you, you know, and I guess, so there's, there's some healthy debate going on. And, 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 uh, one of the reasons that I, I posted the way I did earlier in the week to announce, um, announce this conversation that we're having right now, uh, I used the term master builder, right? Because that's something that gets talked about a lot in architectural circles, but that's not really what we're talking about. Is it? We're not really talking about the idea of, of going back in time and revisiting this, you know, there, there's even some debate, right? Was this even really the thing? Uh, so what are we really talking about here? I think it's an evolution. You know, Alex and I, it's about moving forward and understanding where we're at in society as professionals who uh, have the kind of technology that we have right now. Alex and I were talking about this um, leading up to the interview today. And I think the, the, the way to, for the, the way we think about it is, Let's say uh, why, why are there uh, why were there separations of between the architect, uh, the general contractor? Why are there separations between the different subcontractors? Why are they specialized? Right? Let's 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 dive in and kind of unpack. Just if you're a, con con a concrete sub, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a concrete sub and you have uh, you have a very specialized set of tools, I guarantee you there's only so many tools you can bring to the job site that day in your pickup truck, in your trailer, and all of that. You don't have the ability to say be a sub con uh, a concrete subcontractor, also a plumber, right? So then you can say the same thing about the plumber. The plumber has all these specialized tools. A lot of time they bring the trailer and they have all of their pieces and, and pipes and everything sort of off the shelf, ready to go, right? So there was a there's a fundamental reason why we have these separations and specialties, right? Let's talk about a general contractor and an architect though. With the loss, and and we've seen it down here with uh, with COVID, uh, since COVID happened, um, one of the silver linings has been most, if not all of the municipalities that we permit in now have moved completely digital. 
So number one, it's great for the environment, right? Like we're, I'm tired of printing things off that we know we need to. Why can't we just work digitally? Of course, you're going to have to have that one set on site when you're building. That is the hard copy. But for the most part, we're walking around with iPads. And who's walking around with the iPads with the same set of drawings, with the same kind of set of software to be able to do the material takeoffs, the general contractor and the architect. So all of a sudden, they're sort of meeting in the same area with the same tools, right? So I can I can actually now finally wear the hat of the general contractor plus the architect with one tablet, one one computer. Everything's in my truck or my car at that point. It's all living in, in one thing. And it goes even further with Revit. One of the ideas with Revit, and that's what we use, and I know there's other there's other folks that use uh, Archicad or whatever else, but one of the things about Revit is that it was, it was the idea was our, our contractors were supposed to be able to leverage all of the data in there to do their staging plans, to get, pull off all the material takeoffs, to literally be able to open up the model and take some basic measurements. They can't, they're not supposed to be able to, um, you know, go in there and actually modify the drawings or anything like that. There is sort of that separation of, you know, of what people do, but that's the thing I think I've recognized with and, and come to the conclusion is there's actually no reason for the two to be separate in the sense of, well, what are you doing at the end of the day? You're, you're managing, in, instead of an architect managing the civil engineer, the landscape architect, your drafts people, um, the, all the other engineers, all the other entities, plus the owner. When you transition to architect plus builder and you move into the builder role, you're managing another set of people off of the same set of plans is kind of binding the whole thing together. So I don't think it's looking back in the past. I think it's recognizing, holy cow, we're moving towards the future with this. And the the last little caveat I would add to the whole thing is pretty soon we're going to be able to hit control P on a keyboard. And we're going to be able to print buildings. We're going to, we're going to start be able to it's already been done. Exactly. It already has been done, but it's going to get so seamless to where it's like, holy cow, if we're, if we're virtually modeling these things using whatever building information software you're using, you know, is a solid object. We are going to get to the point where the architect's going to start questioning people who haven't made that leap yet or don't want to make the meet, leap to architect plus builder. I think they're going to have an epiphany and they're going to say, oh my goodness, I'm so close to actually being able to just kind of do this myself. You know, what if you were in then you already put yourself in that position? And, and um, you know, then again, th- then we would talk about the separation of powers, but it's all of these things feeding into one that I think we're getting towards. Yeah, I think I think that's super interesting. I think that's a, an interesting look into the future. Uh, I'm going to take a pause here real quickly and just let everybody know. Uh, many of you I know are, are typically joining us from uh, Facebook in the Entree Architect Community uh, Facebook group. It looks like we're, for some reason, uh, not streaming to Facebook right now. Uh, so that's that's something that's going on. If you have any friends over there and you want to invite them over to uh, LinkedIn or YouTube or Kurt, I see you up there on uh, on Twitch, uh, invite them over because conversation will go on. And remember, um, we do want to include as many of your questions into this conversation as possible. So just post them in the comments from wherever you are. And uh, we, uh, we're going to work out a a brand new process for uh, the situation that's in front of us right now. We'll try to get your questions um, in front of Lance as well. Um, Until we get to that point, um, Catherine, I think. I'm just going to try to push this button and see what happens. All right. (laughs) All right, everybody hang on to their hats. Uh Oh, nothing, nothing happened. Okay. Here's the question. Okay. Chris Novelli wanted to know, uh, are there any tips for anyone in their first 12 months of running our firms? I don't know. That seems a little bit off topic, but perhaps we took that from, he just wanted to know for, because you were a volume, because of your volume, um, what would it be the word model? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, our architecture model is, is volume based. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's, let's see even, because I, I know a little bit of that context as well. Um, yeah. Maybe oh. I'll, I don't know if this is cr- exactly Chris's. There you go. Perfect. Um, I, I would say, especially in what you know now, right? Especially as you've evolved over time, you know, the, the whole architect, builder, developer, et cetera. What advice would you have for somebody that is in the first 12 months of running their own firm in, where are we, 2021? 
you yeah. will be likely hungry, but do not let that hunger allow it to overcome your, um, pre- your, your pragmatic decision making skills. So in other, you know, and, and to cut to the brass tacks, here's an example. The example that I would give is you might encounter, and we still encounter these uh, potential clients where you get an email and maybe it is pages long. It is highly detailed. Run as fast as you can. If you have a, if trust your instincts, if you get a really bad feeling from someone in a meeting and you, but at the same time you're hungry and you're like, oh man, plus they're saying all the right things design wise. I really liked, I really love that they, they want a super modern house. Maybe you're into super modern architecture or they, they want a, a Victorian a complete exact Victorian uh, replica of a house. They, their budget is huge. I would get paid. But if you get that bad feeling and there's a couple hints like that, please trust me when I say run away because you will look back in hindsight and the world works in such mysterious ways, ways all the time that it's possible. And it's happened to us a couple years down the road to those people that we walked away from. We somehow, somehow we'll meet another architect. Somehow we'll meet another builder. Somehow we'll meet somebody and by golly, they were working with that person and then you find, you get an inside peek that you may, maybe never thought. And you're like, oh, God, everything they just said about that potential client that I ran away from was exactly what I was worried about. So glad I walked away from that one and trusted my my, my guts. Yeah. That's that's one of the things I find is interesting. It's a little bit of background. Um, I've gone through two different startups, design, build, architect-led design, build, you know, whatever we want to call it, startups. And the model that, that F9 that you're – um, using is very similar to what I'm used to. So that's very comfortable to me. And, you know, that idea that you talked about it a few minutes ago, we don't build everything, right? And I love, we, we were the same way. I love that outlook because you give yourself the out, right? And, and just that m- maybe, you know, what what could possibly go wrong if we're we're just designing this, but it could be exponentially bad, right? If we start building it, right? And we had that red flag uh, back six months ago or, or uh, whenever it was. Catherine, do you have another one for us? I do. But yeah, I totally agree that trusting your instinct is hard to do, especially if you need to pay your bills. However, yeah. it'll be so much easier if you don't. That, that's a tough, that's terrifying. Right. You know, when you don't know where the next one's coming from, it's hard. Yeah. And, but you do need to trust yourself. So, yep. Yep. All right. So here we go. Toby wants to know Are you better architects because you're building? Absolutely. And it's because of the feedback loop that is now closed on our build projects. Uh, A perfect example of that is even with our drawings. So, on the last single family house that Alex just built in the town that we operate in, our electrician came back to us and he, he, he knew because he worked on a different project with us. So like, Oh yeah, these guys are the architects plus the builders. And so I feel comfortable asking them, you know, I can just ask them about their drawings. And one of his, one of his suggestions and requests was, can we please separate the lighting plan and the switch plan from the outlet plan? And I said, and he explained why. And he goes, he goes, trust me, it, it, it's going to make my job easier. And that's exactly what I want. And we said, sure. So now we do that with all of our projects and it's only been compliments, you know? So there's, that's, that's one good example of it, it literally starting to influence the way we draw. And then I guess my own example, even as the contractor, uh, there was a, a project that we were framing up this summer. And uh, when we were at framing, uh, I think we were just finished with inspection and uh, we had the whole firm out there, including our construction crew because we had to have our we do have our own in-house carpenters now and when they came out there i pulled out the drawings and i goes i go guys and gals guess how many times i had to answer this question and you know i don't know maybe a couple blah 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 and i pointed to the drawing and i said i've had to answer this question way too many times and i would not have had to answer this question if we would just start dimensioning our to the bottom of beams in this particular way so we made a company standard that's how we're doing it from now on so really out there directing and working with the crews has given me an inside look about how they're, how they're looking at the drawings. 
and how they're interpreting the drawings or misinterpreting the drawings and then how we, how we can make those better. Uh, the last one, um, I think is that, you know, it's, it's made us, um, where was my train of thought going with that? Uh, oh, just <clears throat> a, a small critique on architects. If you ever have the chance to you talk to any of these subcontractors, I know, I know some people use AIA contracts and the way you go on a job site, what you can and cannot do. But if you ever get a chance to teach, and I don't think this would get you any trouble, but to just teach these subs how to read a drawing. And what I mean by that is, we are so close, you know, our nose is so close to the drawings all the times. And, and, you know, we understand, okay, on the cover sheet, that's where my index is going to be. I'm going to start being able to navigate through it. But even just quickly showing them, look, if you guys want to see this view, do you know what this little symbol means? And get it, I, I, I can't tell you how much, how many questions have been eliminated from, let's say our framing or our foundation contractors. Those are where the, a lot of the questions come out. I mean, you're forming the building at that point. And just me sitting down with them one day, half hour on the job site, quickly teaching them through it, literally doing a little quiz of like, okay, guys, let's say I wanted to go to this sheet and this sheet. And you you could actually see the, the light bulb go off in their heads. I mean, you could visibly see them get happy. And then um, Gio was very happy about it because then he could, he was like, oh, wow. I just like, they don't actually... They're not, they don't want, you know, everything that they bid on, they put a fixed fee on it typically, and they're trying to beat the clock every time to make their money. Yeah. Right. So their business structure is like that. So if you can, if you can make it more streamlined for them, mm -hmm. they're going to want to work with, with you and your plans more often. I, I love that because, um, I, I don't care what you're designing. I don't care what you're doing. That set of documents that you're producing, it's, it's a communication document, Right. And if you're not speaking the same language, right, they don't understand the language that you're speaking, then we've got a problem and no one comes out better in the end. So uh, I appreciate you pointing that out. And I see Bright, who is uh, one of our uh, uh, longtime listeners, uh, uh, active participants from Ghana, actually. He says uh, from the few projects he's been involved in, uh, anytime they get involved with building, they become better designers. So uh, there's uh, another vote for um, it's. It's helping with that as well. Mm. Well, and another thing is that no matter if we design something, it's not going to get built unless we can communicate that to the people who are supposed yeah. to be building it. So really, we need to know what their language is. You know, that's important to know because it doesn't matter if we're right, if they can't, if they can't, or we think we're right. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yeah. All right. I've got a, a new one here. New. Are we moving on to the next question? Yep. Let's have it. Let's have it. Is Israel wants to know. Do you want to read that, Jeff? Can read that. Sure. Uh, so this this is actually Israel asked this. We do a uh, clubhouse version. We do a coffee mm -hmm. conversation on clubhouse every morning. And Israel was asking this this morning. She says um, architects have traditionally moved further away from risk, more towards risk aversion. Mm -hmm. So what happens when architects um, become builders? Yeah, and then how does the architect builder change that for the risk aversion? Yeah, Rasmus, yeah, how did, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's the idea is that, and and personally, I think this is probably driven by our insurance carriers, but we've moved further and further away from risk. But then by becoming a builder, and I know you've talked about this before, right? You've done development projects. That's one level of risk. You've done projects where you're building for a client, um, different level of risk. Um, so maybe you want to talk about that a little bit, but um, essentially, okay, we've been moving away from risk, but now Lance, you're talking about, you're talking about moving towards risk at this point, aren't you? Yeah. Jonathan Seagal has the best at, and Jonathan Seagal, not the actor, my hero, the architect. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So he, he, the actor is now. So um, the also best advice. <laughs> yeah, right. Probably. I mean, he's working a cop or something else too. Yeah, weird Al was. The best advice he gives in his architect to developer course is buy as much insurance as you can. I cannot stress how important that is. You need insurance is actually cheap. It really is. Like there are some very high level premiums of insurance for sure. But when you, if you've ever been in pre-litigation or litigation, you start seeing what can happen when things start to stack up, then you, it'll put everything in perspective. And number one, if you did, if you took the advice, uh, 
then it'll you'll re- you'll be oh thank god thank thank goodness we did that thank goodness we we bought the insurance thank goodness we put the extra insurance on top of it i'm so glad in hindsight it's it's going to look cheap i promise you it's going to look cheap um everybody who practices in this industry at some point is going to get to the point of either pre-litigation or litigation and i'm the, i don't mean a builder i mean an architect like you are the the it we're, we're there as a society there's no way around it so I understand the, you know, the risk aversion and um, wanting to get further and further away from it. And I'm suggesting you go further towards it. It's risk versus reward. The more responsibility you take on, the bigger the reward and also the bigger, bigger failure you could make. So really it's, it's up to you. And I, I think I would probably point the whole thing back to, again, try it on your house first. Just try it on your house. We have one of the, one of the coolest stories so far about the course that we, that we launched is that one of our clients who we are just finishing up the structure engineering for, um, he's a very successful entrepreneur, but he is not a builder, nor is he an architect. Matter of fact, he doesn't really have that much experience at all. In the state of Colorado, though, if you, you can build your own primary residence, you don't even have to be uh, licensed it, because it's, you know, it's sort of like this American dream continued, right? He was one of the first people to buy the course. And then he, after he got through video four, he goes, oh my God, like, I'm so glad I bought this. I, I feel like I can do this. I feel like I can do this. And we don't teach you in the course exactly a, but you know, here's how you frame a wall. That is not, not as, first of all, that's not even what a contractor, general contractor does. Second of all, that's, it's not our expertise is, is literally, you know, going out there and framing and we don't, we don't really do that. Um, so that, you know, starting with your own house. So how much is Polly D going to save? That's, that's their client. How much is he going to save? He's going to save somewhere between 70 and a hundred thousand dollars on his, on his own house. And he understands the risk, right? He, he, he understands the risks involved with him doing it. What if he screws up? You know, we had another owner who tried to build their own house uh, a couple years back. And I remember they somehow trusted like the concrete sub too much and they got poured out a square by two feet. You know, that's giant. Yeah. That's, you know, that's huge. But you know, so no matter what, it just it just depends on how hungry you how hungry you are or uh, what appetite you have, and that you're able to stomach for that reward. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think back to that past life that I talked about a few minutes ago, and you know the reason the reason that we started our first design and build entity was that we got so tired of, uh, and and part of this is on us. I mean, we have to take some of this responsibility, but we got so tired of, uh, a builder, not, not building what we had designed, right. Deviating from some, uh, details or whatever. And then of course it's, it's, uh, you know, you get into the stereotypical son, I've been building it this way or longer than you've been alive. You know, that, that kind of story. And, you know, we, we all sat down and, and, uh, thought about it. We said, you know what? Uh, I'm in Indiana, uh, as you know, and um, this is one of the states where you can do just about anything without an architect, right? And so we knew that by and large, when people were, were, when our clients were hiring us, they were making a real investment in design. And so that was our first idea. You know, we're going to, when we start building this, we're going to do this so that we can protect our clients' investment in design. And so that was our original concept. And the more that I got into it, the more I realized, yes, the further we step into this, more risk we are taking, certainly. But we're also, uh, the further we step into it, the more control we're gaining over the outcome of this. And, and that's part of the balance too, right? Control, risk, reward, it's, it's, all, it's all tied together. And there's, a, there's some sort of uh, balance there somewhere. Yeah, Absolutely. Got another one, Catherine? I do. All right. Erica, oh, well, she said, given the complexities of the different types of buildings, I had to cut that out because there, there's a word yeah. limit. So uh, what should the required training be for the experience, uh, to, for an experience for an architect to become a builder? Given well, the there period? are, yeah, great question. So we go over this in detail and in the course. Be, uh, and there are there are requirements, right? So 
the the blanket statement I could make here, and every jurisdiction is different. So just know that there's going to be a different version of what I'm about to say. So there's three types of contractors. There's a type A. Uh, let's start at the bottom, actually. There's a the type C contractor is uh, you can do single family houses, right? Pr- pretty Not too difficult to get. You actually don't need any experience whatsoever, typically, right? It might, it might vary per jurisdiction, but then it goes back to what I just said about um, owner occupying and, you know, the owner being able to build their own house. Uh, class B contractor is you can build any structure that is three stories or less and including commercial. And for that one, you, uh, you have to take a test and it's a, it's a different kind of test. Um, it is open book. You can bring the IRC in, you can bring the IBC in, and you can bring the concrete manual in. Uh, but you have to show experience and that's, that's a critical part. And uh, like, I haven't found a jurisdiction that doesn't require that yet that you can just take the test and be done with it. Because if you can do any building that's three stories or less, and that is commercial, think about what that means, right? That means like municipal buildings. That means like true public life, life safety and welfare. Yep. All the stuff that we, we are trying to uh, always tie to the architecture license. A class A license is sky's the limit. Literally skyscrapers. Sky is the limit, right? You can build whatever you want. So it's an, another version of the test. Um, it's, it's longer, it's more difficult. It's also open book, but then you have to show a, an extensive amount of, uh, experience on that one. So, uh, I hold and Alex does too, a class B contractor's license. And the experience that I gained happened from literally the time I, when I was 13, that was my first job, uh, was a uh, roofing, working for a roofing contractor all the way up until, um, I graduated college and then some beyond because I did some work for, for uh, contractors and, and stuff like that, even, even, even as an architect, uh, going to the job sites and, and doing stuff like that or as, a, or as an unlicensed designer. So there is required training and, and experience. There you go. I mean, I, I, I guess I wouldn't say the, the training. I mean, I, here's the way I would think about the training. The training is, and I really compliment actually the way the test is set up for a contractor compared to an architect uh, because the tests for the contractors are to the point, right? Like you're the one, you're the one doing the final thing with the building, right? So there's no like arguing, arguing with a building official about the code or anything like it's got to be a cut and dry answer. And so the way that what it's, what, what preparing for that test does is it, it trains you to be able to quickly sift through the code book and find exactly where that code is and exactly what you got to do. And then it also trains you to like, to think about who, who you're going to call, who you're going to, who you're going to talk to. Uh, so that is, um, I think there is that level of training in there. Uh, you know, don't think of it also, also as like, if, if I become a general contractor, am I going to be out tilting up walls and framing them? No, that's, you really want to rely on the people that do it every day in and out and stuff like that. Sure. There's some, there's some tasks that you could pick up and yes, we have done some self-performing stuff, even myself, but the only way I was comfortable doing that is, like I said, I'm 38 now. When I first my first job was was working for a roofing contractor, I have an applied associate's degree in building construction technology. So I was, you know, wanted to be, I wanted to be a builder before I actually wanted to be an architect. Um, but then I just found out I love going to school, so I continued to go to school. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Uh, quick note. Yes, we have blocked, uh, Leonardo. Uh, so we won't be seeing those comments anymore. And if you want those to dis- disappear, just make more comments. Yeah, and those everybody needs on. a comment. Um, we need about seven more comments and those will go off the screen and then I can put them back on the screen. Cause I can't. Michelle, get them off. Michelle be a hero. I see she's watching <laughs> Michelle Grace hotel. My, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. Just say seven things, Michelle. So, um, yeah. but no, just you, you can't enjoy your life now, right? Just, mm-hmm. Just we can see them on the side. Okay. Yeah, they can't see them. Um, you know, we, I don't even want to say what else could go wrong, but I'm just going to say, just bring it on, whatever right. else. <laughs> it's live. It's live. There's there's no net. Um, <laughs> but so let, yeah. let's let's wrap that back around because um, you know we a few minutes ago we talked about your advice for somebody in their first uh, twelve months, and so I think about. The idea, and actually, we talked about this on Clubhouse this morning as well. What happens when you have someone that's just graduating from architecture school uh, in in Boulder or wherever, right? And they say, you know what? 
I, I really want to design and build houses. I don't know if they have any experience or not. Do they, do they just jump right in? you know, as that lowest level contractor, is that the best way? Or what do you suggest for somebody like that? That's not a bad idea. Uh, I wouldn't, I think, well, the trick with that is, is like, how good are you at getting your own business? I've always had the ability to somehow, yeah, that's a good point. Um, honestly, and so is Alex, like somehow we will, you know, the strangest ways, even now, some posts, people will find us and there'll be a connection and all of a sudden we're doing business with them. And it's, it's, it's really good. I don't know if it's just because we put out so much business stuff and it comes back and that's the law of attraction. Doesn't matter. So there's that. Let's say, but let's let's explore the worst case scenario. So let's say you 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 just maybe you're an introvert. You know, maybe you just can't get out there and knock on a door and stuff like that. I would, if I was you, I would work for a general contractor if you can. Hmm. That would be the best way because if you could just, you'll understand, you'll be sort of between the subs and the general contractor. And you'll probably be doing a lot of, a lot of grunt work, like, you know, going and getting uh, blueprints, uh, or I call them blueprints, sorry, going and getting construction drawings, uh, getting extra drawings that people need. Yeah. Sorry about that. I know I, there was a comment in the Ontario tech group, like quit doing the blueprints. I know. Oh, who uh, really cares? You can call them blueprints. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, but the, would the, and, and then there'll be a lot of weird down downtime. Like we have I, some of our employees who work for us as under the contracting arm in the company, I will have them like sit at a job site for two hours. They get paid to do it. And it's like, you got to wait for the building inspector and going through the process of walking through with the building inspector, looking at the plans, understand what they're looking for, understand how maybe the sub screwed up or they miss something. It always happens. You are not going to pass every, every, every inspection uh, just because there's so many moving parts. Right. And then, then, then you got to work with the subcontractor and they got to correct those things or they got to tweak some things. Or maybe the inspector just didn't quite, little, or they missed something. The other day, I, they missed a, a, a turnoff valve on a, on some water line and I missed it too. And then I called my sub and he's like, I put it there. Trust me, I don't fail an inspection. So that <laughs> was the plumber. He, he's great. Uh, that's, I think, one of the best ways to do, really, if you, if you can, man, if you could do that for one year, the things you'll learn. And then the other version would be if you do start working for some, subcontractor people, right? So if you, if you just said, I'm going to go work on a framing crew for, for a year, uh, under an electrician, something like that. I think there's a huge opportunity for people to do that right now, because we are hurting so badly for experienced trades, tradesmen and tradeswomen. The, there's the labor shortage, you know, we have somehow overcorrected in society. This is my own opinion about everybody needs to go to school. And I think we need to start transitioning back to have a little bit more balance. I mean, I even tell my children uh, that, hey, really, like, I'm not sure we're going to spend all the money to go to liberal arts school if you don't know exactly what you want to do. Like, Right, exactly. You know, I tell my kids that too. Yeah, yeah. So it's okay to take a year or two off. I, I don't think I don't think we're looking down on it anymore in that kind of uh, – no. that kind of uh, – Play. Yeah, good. I'm glad you agree, Catherine, because yeah, I mean, $75,000 a year to just stay in your bed and eat pizza. You can do that at home for free. That's, you know, yeah. if that's yeah. what I'm going to do as a parent, I feel like that's a lot of, that's a lot of money. You mean yep. you're not charging them to do it from home? Oh, well, on my third kid. Yeah. My first two, I fell for it. My third one, unfortunately, she's, she's not going to get to do that. Smart. Smart. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, I think, I think getting your, getting your, getting, getting your feet off the ground in that kind of way, it, it can only help, you know, then, then there's all the issue of like, so that's kind of what I did, right? I, I did trade school first, a lot of hands-on construction, very blue collar background, family, everything. I was the first one to actually get like a bachelor's and a master's degree. And so when I did transition, the, the thing I would say to, if there is anybody listening now or in the future to this, if you do that, where you're doing the blue, blue collar technical in the field, hands-on stuff, when you get to architecture school, you might struggle like I did and you're going to have to let go of that practical stuff for a while and kind of get into the nirvana of, of like being free with design and not caring how it goes together. And I promise you, once you get back to that fourth and fifth year, it you'll put it together again. And then, and then it really does kind of fill that feedback loop. Kind of like the one I'm talking, I talked about earlier with the electrical plans and having our beams dimensioned differently and being able to tell the subs, here's how you read a set of drawings, all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah. That's great advice. That's, I, I like that a lot. Um, you mentioned something uh, a minute or two ago about the employees that are uh, under the construction side. So how are you structured? Are you, are you structured as architects that are also building or you, do you have a separate entity for the architecture side and, and one for the uh, construction side or how do you set that up? Separate companies. Okay. Always set up separate companies, 100%, and have them completely distinct financially, the way the legal entities are set up, the way payroll works. I mean, you don't mix the don't mix them at all. Because if one domino falls, then the whole thing goes goes away. Separate insurance companies. Um, so the 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 construction arm, you know, our architecture arms, F9 productions, our construction arm is F14 productions. Um, one is an S Corp. One is an LLC. You need to talk to your accountant and attorneys about why and you should or shouldn't do one or the other. That's not up to me. But making them separate is so important. So then our employees for for both of those, every once in a while, you know, one will maybe an architect will go out and help one of the carpenters hang some doors and stuff like that. But for the most part, 95% of their job, if they're working for F14, is they you are basically a, a, a carpenter. Um, doing everything, uh, our guy, our, our guys do on the construction side, they will do anything rough and finish carpentry. Um, the only thing that we probably will never get to is like foundations. Uh, cause, and it kind of goes back to my, my thought process that I laid out earlier about the form work. It's like, there's a certain limit of, you know, you guys specialize in that all day. We, we couldn't compete with it and all of that for us. It's more about quality control and having that in house yeah. and, and knowing that, you know, keeping once they, once they show up on site, can we keep them there for six weeks and just stay there? It's a different level of kind of stability that I don't think a lot of uh, construction workers get to see because they're like one morning they could be at one job site next month. They're 30, 40 minutes away. So that's what we've been trying to build on on that side with this new company. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to talk about this for another couple of hours. Uh, why don't we, I want to, I saw a question just a minute ago that I wanted to, uh, uh, throw out there, right? You sort of answered it. I, th well, no, you actually didn't, but I, I think I can guess what the answer is, but there you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. She's reading uh, my mind. Yeah. Do I act as a builder for custom projects, uh, for others or do I develop our own projects? We have developed our own projects in the past. And the two that I would point to is uh, the first tiny house that we built, we designed and built. Um, that was an anarchy build. I mean, you don't have to be really, if, as soon as it gets on uh, trailers and, and wheels back in the day, anyway, before the IR, I think the IBC or the IRC adopted something in 2018, where now there is sort of these set of codes. We built it before there was all of that. Uh, that was the first one we designed, built and developed. And that was so, it was very successful because it led to us being on HGTV and a lot of, uh, media attention, several published we were published in several books because of it the architecture award and then it led to two more tiny houses that we designed and built but we did not develop so we didn't put any of our capital into that and then that was profitable enough that those last two tiny houses that were for a fortune 500 company that we had enough capital over we we bought a piece of land and then we did do our first first and maybe only development um from the ground up uh so it was a triplex and a sixplex so now our main focus is we will, we will act as architect plus builder for projects that we designed. And in the course, we kind of outlay when, when we found is the right time during the design process to start, start um, putting out the right uh, feelers to the owner on, hey, we'd be interested in building this, um, you know, and what that might look like. And if you get, there's like a, there's a couple of hints that, you know, you need to kind of plant and some seeds you need to lay. And hopefully by the end of your design process, you've, you've got them sold on you. Um, even honestly, without signing a contract, obviously you need to, you know, get things signed and deposited and all that. But like I was telling Jeff at the beginning of the podcast, John, is that uh, we are much more selective with who we'll build for than who we'll design for. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned, we're getting close to the top of the hour and you mentioned the course. So, um, 
For those of you that have just joined us, um, in case you missed it, this is Lance Psycho. He's he's the co-founder of F9 Productions. He's the co-host of Inside the Firm podcast, and he's co-teacher, I'm going to call it, uh, of a course called Architect to Builder. So tell me about the course, Lance. Ar- what's Architect the Builder all about? How do I find it? Um what do, what do I do? If I want to become a builder, if I'm an architect, and I want to become a builder. What do you suggest? Yeah. So uh, I suggest you at least t- go to architects guide to, so it's architects, plural guide, to.com. And that'll bring you to a splash page and you'll see a nice little intro. It's like a 30, 40 second intro that Alex and I talk about what is in the course. And then you see what's in the course. Um, and, you know, so right now, if you if you went there and you went to purchase it, um, you could use co- promo code ITF. That stands for inside the firm. Promo code ITF will get 10% off. What we try to do with the course is we are trying to fill a void and a gap that we think exists. And one of them that exists that we found is um, people who grew up in families who their dad was a builder, their grandpa was a builder. Their grandpa's grandpa's with a builder. Um, there, you know, mom was everybody was involved in the process, right? Maybe mom was the builder. Uh, that's totally possible. So why, like, th- there are, but there's a certain segment of society that, like, my dad wasn't a builder. Um, he builds with me now, but he kind of like quit farming to do. The, eventually, he just farming didn't work for him, and he decided he wanted to be, kind of be a builder like me. But there's a lot of folks out there that cannot fall back on a family member or somebody close to them that could maybe either give them that first job or, you know, they can ask all of these questions too. So that's what this course is really about is we are showing, is it difficult to become a builder? Uh, Yeah. In the sense of a class B, I mean, you need to have all that, that uh, a class B contractor need to have all that experience because a building official is going to literally look at all the photos and references from with other contractors that you've built with. So what we do is we really unpeel the whole onion and we lay it bare, right? And there's a lot of terms that maybe even as an architect you've heard of, um, a small firm architect in particular about like, what does a construction draw? What does that look like? Um, so we start from ground zero and we say, here's, you, you're an architect, you're in your design meetings. Here's where you could start pitching the idea of maybe you building it. Or if you are an owner, this, even if you're just an owner, like, you know, somebody who's successful as a doctor or something and they took the course, it could help influence and show them how they could actually manage the process. So we, we then go into, you know, pass the sales part of it, right. Where we talk about these hints and, and when, when, and when, when, when is the appropriate meeting in the design meeting for you to start pitching yourself as the potential builder. And then we, and then we show here's the different licenses. Here's what it takes to obtain those licenses. Uh, Every jurisdiction is going to be different there. You know, there's that disclaimer, but here's the experience. Here's, here's the test. Alex even goes in because he took the test most recently. I was licensed first and his experience about and tips about how to take that test. You might be one of the most interesting things I think about architects is like, we are swimming in these code books all day long. We all know that like, yes, we get to draw cool buildings. That is a, my, that, I know you're laughing. That is a small, and I know you're laughing. It's a small portion of what we do. Right. Like I like, I tell people now like, Oh, we just argue with the government and look through codes, code books, you know, but, uh, we're swimming in that world so much, you're already kind of there. It's just about you understanding how to take that test and prepare for the test. You will, I guarantee you'll be able to go through that book confidently, just like Alex could and crush that thing. And then the experience component, you know, how do you obtain experience with that? A lot of us are also as architects performing construction administration services. So we're out there hopefully developing these great relationships with these other builders. So how can you leverage those two things that we're already doing and get in there and then make, you know, get to that point of being, being a contractor. Uh, we talk about how, how, you know, again, this, we've already hinted about a lot of this stuff about, uh, the separation of companies. I think it's so important that you separate your companies. I think it's so important that you buy as much insurance as you can. And then we go through, and one of the things that Alex and I have always had the opportunity to do, especially when we got laid off and then we started our own firm was, we got laid off from firms that I think did some fundamentally bus- incorrect things as business. When I look back now as a business owner, I look at those businesses, great architects. I mean, what can you say about Daniel Liebskin, right? That's who Alex worked for. So, but 
they, they, they failed in the sense of keeping us employed. And so one of the fundamental things we did at F9 is we said, we, we have an opportunity to literally look at this and design our company exactly how, in a totally different way. Why don't we just swipe the whole squate, the slates uh, clean? So an example of how we do that in the course is uh, you'll see that there's, there's different ways that banks set up the construction draws. So there's different ways that other contractors set up how their spreadsheets and their bids and everything look. And some of them are, for example, are some of them are set up by like CSI section, Construction Specifiers Institute and the, the divisions. So one of the th fundamental things we did with our construction template that, by the way, you get, you, you get a lot of like content from us that you can just tweak and use on your own. Yeah, part of the course. It is, it is so valuable just from that reason, I think, is we said, well, why don't we set up the spreadsheet so it's sequential? Meaning, here's the first round of draws that you'll probably do, which are maybe your foundation, your underground stuff. And so it's giving you hints all along the way, even if you haven't ever built your own house from the ground up about, oh, this is sequentially how the order of operations is going to go for that project. So um, we, and then we show you, you know, what a typical construction draw looks like. There's some contract templates that you obviously, you need to speak with your attorney and legal team and, and get them honed in for yourself. But we really lay it, lay it bare there. If you notice one thing I didn't notice or didn't say is like, we're not teaching you how to plumb a sink. We're not teaching you how to frame a wall. It's not about that. It's about, it's about really seeing laying bare like, oh, this is basically all of the kind of documentation it's going to take to perform my job as the general contractor. This is the general sequence. This is the way I get there to the licensure. And this is how I can make it happen. And it all points back again to that. If I built my own house, if I paid 500 bucks for this course, I might have just saved myself $70,000 because there's no contractor fee, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's that's an important realization. Tell me again, if you would, what's the promo code? Promo code is ITF. Just like inside the firm. Yes, sir. All right, I'm going to put that up on the screen for anybody that um, – is interested in that. And uh, I thought it was also interesting that you're talking about uh, the course being valuable for an architect that may want to become a builder, but also potentially uh, one of your clients, one of your uh, owners, if they want to learn how to build their own home or do their own project. Yeah. Our goal, just like with the podcast and almost everything we teach at the University of Colorado Boulder too, is uh, we have just always given, given, given and of course, there's there's money associated with both of those things. But the, we just found that the more you give and the more you try to help the community, um, in this case, it's the architecture community, um, the more it just comes back tenfold in the, at the end of the day. And maybe that's that law of attraction that I talked about earlier, right? So our goal is to, to just help architects find more avenues to be successful and, and lengthen um, their cash flow. You know, Nick Renard with, with Dig Architecture, when I interviewed him at the last AIA conference that was in person, one of the one of the things he said that will stick with me for the rest of my life was the reason why it really made sense to him to become architect plus builder was he going through the Great Recession like we did. He says, you know, he said, if if you're designing the house and they've got financing secured. And if you, it's shovel ready, right? It, like once the financing is secured, all the documents are signed, that money's not going away. All that money that the bank has for that project is set aside. Yeah. It's allocated. It's not going away, even if the economy crashed. So you just extended a project and your cash flow, maybe two or three fold, if you consider taking this. And that's one of the reasons why we were able to expand after March and all of the chaos that happened last year we were still able to expand our firm by, by 30%. And that's huge. And I mean that with like staffing. So we hired, we hired an additional five people last year because we were able to extend those projects out and fill the gap when architecture kind of fell through for a little bit. Yeah, that's a really great point. I, I appreciate that. Um, it's also a great point to wrap this up, but um, you know, we were talking off, off, uh, offline before we get started here and I told you that that was, that was really what I was interested in in this conversation is, is looking at ways we can progress 
as a profession, looking for creative, um, you know, new, new ways, new business models. And somebody's going to argue this isn't a new business model. Sure, it's not, but different, something different than a tra- the traditional model of an architecture firm. And so I really appreciate uh, that lesson and that story right there because that's that's the answer. This is um, this is a way that you could change the way that you practice. It could change, um, you know, how you succeed, how you serve clients, the value that you produce, uh, et cetera. So, uh, Lance, I really appreciate this. It was a great conversation. Um, thanks for everything that you shared with us today. Thank you so much, you guys, for having me on, Catherine and, and John. I really appreciate, uh, or, uh, Jeff, sorry, the, I really appreciate the time. Um, even though we had some technical difficulties and Al Gore couldn't be here, uh, this this was great. I would anytime you guys would like to uh, talk again. We're all we're all yours, and we're all ready for it. All right, we appreciate that. And yes, uh, uh, technical difficulties aside, here we here we are. We're, the show must go on. So with that, I'm going to let uh, Alex go. But if anybody wants, or I'm going to let Lance I'm just go. Get back at you now for calling him John. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There we go. Now we're even. <laughs> You're even. The wheels are falling off. Uh, <laughs> if anybody wants to stick around and uh, give some final thoughts on the conversation today, uh, you're welcome to. We'll stick around here for a few minutes. But Lance, re- again, really appreciate it. Uh, tell tell Al that uh, we know that he was you know up on a ladder in front of a screen talking about the inconvenient truth. But uh, <laughs> we'll talk again Love soon. You. Really appreciate okay. it. Okay. Right. See ya. Bye. Yeah. All right. With that, um, thank you for all of you who did find us. And and again, we know it was uh, it's a little bit hard. If you went to Facebook, we have no idea why we're not live on Facebook right now. No, but um, John, but, uh, John and live. Christian both posted. They both posted links to where people could find us. So that was Good. helpful. Thank yep. you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, now I'm interested to know what everybody thinks. What's your Maybe start with uh, what's your biggest takeaway from this conversation today? Uh, put that in the comments section from wherever you are, uh, LinkedIn or or uh, YouTube or Twitch. Um, and then, you know, what's your biggest takeaway? Um, Bright says it's useful. Uh, Tim found it on, on Catherine's page, the link. Um, biggest takeaway for the conversation, but then also, um, do you think that architect plus builder and that was sort of the that was the plot twist right there right we're not really talking about master builder in the form that we do sometimes um talking about architect plus builder do you think that's a viable avenue for you you put that in the comments section as well i i wonder whether you can get um ceus for that course that would have been a very I mean, Before, mundane question to ask, but I mean, if, if I could, if I could get all my credits for the year, I would take that course. Uh, that's a good point. I think you could certainly self-report it, right? I don't know that you'd get any health, self, yeah, health, health, health safety, health. welfare, but um, seems like mm. you could self-report. Yeah, it's too much paperwork for me, Jeff. <laughs> I, um, you know, it made me realize listening to him that I do spend a lot of time in the field talking to all the subs. So, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people do. Yeah, I see James's uh, comment there. I appreciate that, James. It says, I like what Lance said about closing the loop. And I think that's a really good point. Um, again, like I said, I've, I've got a little bit of history with this type of, of um, firm setup and firm format. And I think a lot of you would be surprised at how good you actually were. Uh, because we're not, we're not talking about swinging a hammer. Uh, we're talking about managing things. Um, a lot of it, like Lance said, is not all that different than what you're doing in your construction administration in a way. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're doing construction admin now, let's see, what do we, let's see. John, John says he self reports C and C for AIA CE credits. Do you really do that, John? Maybe, I maybe you, right. Jeff, maybe you could work it out so we could actually get the credits for it. Well, um, get on maybe. that paperwork. Yeah. That, that might be in the works. <laughs> um, well, Mark, Mark also says he thought the value of the feedback loop was was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think even if we decide not to be builders ourselves, having more conversations with subs about what's useful for them from our drawings is is I don't know. This seems like a good idea to me too. I got that as a takeaway. 
What, one of the things that Catherine and I talked about earlier today that it, it kept popping into my head during this conversation was, um, and Lance talked about it at one point, you know, having these conversations on site and working things out. And um, to me, what's really, really different is that as the architect, you may be communicating with the GC, but as the architect plus builder, you may be communicating with between the architect and the sub. And I think just like Lance was talking about um, the electrical contractor requesting that you pull the two different, uh, I think it was the switching and the lighting plans apart. Wow. Again, it's that, it's that loop, right? It's the feedback loop being closed. Think about how powerful, powerful that is. You're communicating more directly with the people that are actually doing the work. Plus you're getting that feedback returned to you and making your, your work, your documents better. So I, I love that. Uh, I love that aspect of it as well. I just saw a minute ago, Christian asked, uh, I'm trying to find, uh, will it be posted to Facebook so we continue the, can continue the conversation? Here's what I'm going to try to do. Uh, I'm going to try to download the video of this and then, uh, assuming I can accomplish that, I will try to upload it into the Facebook group. So it'll look different, but it'll, I think it'll just look like a video post to the Facebook group, but I'm going to attempt to get it there so that we can, you can continue to comment on it over there in the Facebook group, even after we're not live anymore. Uh, what else do we have here? It is pretty intriguing, though. I wonder, um, you know, with more risk comes more reward, right? So reward, we're talking about money, I suppose, as well as satisfaction. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It, so it, is that, it worth it? that was the question, I guess. Well, sure. That's a question you've got to ask yourself, right? It's a question you've got to answer for yourself. But I, I would also say that um, there are an awful lot of professions and industries out there that are not as risk averse, you know, that are laying things on the line. And, and uh, you know, I've got to think that just about anything we do, the more we put into it, more invest, more we invest into it, the more risk we take, even, even on very, very simple levels. Um, the more we're going to get out of it. You know, I guess I could look at it in terms of maybe even exercise. The more I put into the exercise, of course, we're not talking about the same kind of risk. We're not talking about the same kind of investment, but the more I put into it, the more I'm going to get out of it, hopefully, <laughs> theoretically. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what my doctor tells me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. It is pretty intriguing. I'd be, I, I'm going to go check it out myself, see what, see what it's about. I think working for a contractor, as an architect, you could work for a contractor and still be part of the whole team and get to know a lot about what's happening that way also. And yeah. still, just to get an idea of what's involved before before you jump yeah. in. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, uh, Lance and I have a lot of similarities. You know, I grew up around construction just because it was in a lot of my family, a lot of my uncles and things like that. And uh, I never worked fast food. I never, I actually did have a retail job, but most of the jobs I ever had, even as a teenager were around construction. So that always, it, that probably influenced yeah. you know, going to architecture school as well. But, um, but I also think that, you know, even, even if you've got some experience under your belt, um, being on site and understanding, you know, how, how everything really works. You know, the example of, of changing the way we dimension, right, to the underside of the beam, that's brilliant, right? It's more about communication. Um, right. Well, that's the important dimension right there is to the bottom of the beam a lot of the time, right? Yep. So, um, what else? There was something I was going to say, and I forgot what it was just now, Jeff. Just went out that's of right. my head. That's right. What um, Mark says Mark LePage says, and more than double your fee on every project you perform as as a construction, a CM, a construction manager. Um, this is also something that Catherine and I were talking about today because in, in the former life that I talked about, you know, the margins on our construction side 
were um, probably th- reasonably three times what the margins were on the architecture side. And I know if you listen um, to some of the other interviews that Alex and Lance have done, for instance, with Enix Sears on the uh, Business of Architecture podcast, they'll talk about uh, I don't remember exactly how they put it, but but not robbing Peter to pay Paul, I think, was was one of the ways they say it. Um, in in the way that they set it up, they have, and, and just as, as Lance described it, right, there's the construction side that they have set up. There's the architecture side that they have set up. There's separate entities and all of those things, which um, means that you're not doing the typical design build downfall where you take, well, you know, we'll make, we'll make a good percentage over here, maybe on the construction side. So we'll discount the percentage on the architecture side, right? We separate it. We, we do architect plus builder as Lance described it. We have a fee here and we have a fee here. And these are the fees. Think about what that just did to your, um, I guess it's multiple business models at that point, but think about that, what that just did, right? Did you have 6%, 6% on the architecture side and 20% on the construction side? That's, that's a big change. Isn't it kind of strange though for your, if you're, if you're build, building on a con- percentage of the construction cost and then you're creating the con- the, cost, the construction cost, wouldn't that be a little... If, if your architectural fee changed because of the cost, you know what I mean? You're kind of setting, it seems like a little bit. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I find intriguing about uh, the way that Lance was talking about it. We're going to design this. And at some point we're going to talk about whether or not it makes sense for us to build this and we don't build everything. So that, that automatically creates, and I think we don't have, uh, I can't ask this question right now, but I think that creates a little bit of a break in there, right? So, uh, because that that is um, that is speaking from experience, that is something that a, a uh, uh, an owner will ask. Oh, well, wait a minute. You know, what is this a conflict of interest? Uh, they'll ask about that. You know, if you're charging based on percentage of construction, are you just bumping this side up to raise this side up as well? But I, I love the distinction where they've got it completely separated like that. And you don't even have that conversation until you figure out whether it makes sense for all parties. And like Mark said, transparency re- resolves that conflict. It's a good yeah. point. So Jay said that he doesn't, he never talks to the subs on his projects, just the general um, contractor. Is there, is that just because of the way Jay works or is that, is that a problem? Are we, I'm not an AIA member, but is that an AIA thing? Not to, you're not supposed to talk to mm-hmm. the subs. I don't, I don't think it's an AIA thing. It's probably, I see he's referencing construction management. So CM, uh, and then you're into the, basically the weeds of, of, um, uh, different, uh, structures, I guess, different legal structures. Uh, but, uh, the construction manager would typically, I think, I think it's okay to say typically the construction manager would then probably hire or or work with a GC. So there may, so it's layers, right? The construction manager, we've got this narrow screen, construction managers up here, the GC is up here, the subs are down here. So this is the interaction. Right. I know. If you structure it in a different way, then you might, you know, if you were acting as the GC, which I think is uh, what Lance is talking about, I might be wrong, but if you were working as a GC, it would be a different. Yeah. uh, I don't control the subs either, but I, I guess one of the contractors I work for, he just likes me to go out and manage the site. Or manage, go talk to the framers and then to go talk to the plumber and everything. So I end up doing that because I probably shouldn't, I guess. Um, I, yeah, I don't direct them. I just, I just talk to them about their questions and answer their questions. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe that I shouldn't be saying that on a, on a live um, <laughs> public forum here. Well, it's, it's going to go into the record. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so Jay Jay says he's he doesn't control the subs as an architect, and and that would be right, and that would get back to that um, having the the distinct uh, separation. 
right? We're, we're an architect over here, over here, but we're the builder over here and there's a separation there. Yeah. Jay's right. I should get paid more. I'm working on that, Jay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to see Adam Steiner uh, in the conversation today because Adam is, is in a similar situation. Uh, lots of uh, construction experience there, architecture experience there, and building some of his own things now. Uh, Adam, uh, I apologize for having to ask this, but remind me what the name of your podcast is. Uh, it's also fun to have other podcasters. Catherine has a has her own podcast, which is called Talking Home Renovations with the House Maven. There you go. Find it wherever uh, wherever you get your podcasts are yep. consumed. And then uh, Adam's got a, a podcast that's also focused on uh, uh, home construction as yep. well. So- Mine's for homeowners, but uh, Mark LePage is coming on my show. Um, we're recording this month, actually. So he's going to wow. be talking about his experience renovating a, ho- a family hoarder house. So nice. Very yeah. nice. How did you land Mark LePage? That's a. I know. It was a big one. That's yeah. like my Seth Godin is now is Mark LePage on, on mine. <laughs> you heard it here first, Mark LePage. You are Catherine Seth Godin. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, big score. Builder versus buyer is uh, Adam's podcast. There, very good. And I don't know if Adam is still on with us or not. Yeah, I think he's. Might I haven't seen him in a little while. Okay, we, we may have. Uh, he may have bounced off. Uh, but with that, we'll, I know we're well past the hour. appreciate all of you hanging in there. Uh, we'll take any you know last minute uh, comments and things uh, if you've got them. Uh, but if not, we will uh, wrap this up here momentarily. As uh, is the practice, uh, we'll be back to the uh, context and clarity conversation format tomorrow, hopefully live streaming into uh, – uh, into the Entree Architect Facebook group as usual tomorrow afternoon, and the topic tomorrow will be will be going will be going back to our weekly uh, visit to digital and social media platforms. And tomorrow we're going to talk about Facebook for architects. So I don't know, maybe that's a little bit meta <laughs> having that conversation inside Facebook. But I'll be I'll be curious to see what you're doing on Facebook. Um, probably, probably have a uh, personal profile. Maybe you have a company page. Maybe you even have a group for your clients or you participate in other groups. So it'll be interesting to see what uh, advice everybody has, what best practices and questions everybody has about uh, Facebook for architects, what uh, benefit you see or don't see in being on Facebook. So uh, with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, again, appreciate all of you. Thank you, Catherine, for being here. Um, mm. Appreciate, appreciate a rough Lance. Day. For, uh, a- yep, so a little bit, it. but that's, that's, yeah, I thought it went just fine. We, uh, we had some, uh, what do we call them? hecklers in the, in the crowd? Uh, that's the first for us at this point. Um, so definitely some technical. <laughs> I tef- didn't realize there was a heckler at first. I thought, yeah. wow, somebody feels pretty strongly <laughs> about the subject. <laughs> somebody felt very strongly and negatively about whatever it was we were talking about at the moment, yeah. but, uh, yeah. but we got them blocked and, um, and that's okay. It's, it's part of the format and, yeah, uh, part of the fun. yep. Part of the fun. So thank you. Thanks all of you. Um, again, thanks to Lance for, uh, coming sharing the knowledge with us today. Great conversation today. Um, appreciate each and every one of you for all of these conversations that we get to have. I really enjoy this hour plus together, uh, that we have every day. So with that, uh, please take care of yourself, take care of those around you, uh, be well and be safe and, uh, take a little bit of time tonight to breathe, relax, come back again tomorrow refreshed and rejuvenated and ready to do it again. We're going to talk about Facebook tomorrow. I'm interested to see where that one goes. So thanks, everybody. Have a great evening.